<clears throat> so, um, we are Swiss, so we have to be punctual. It's, uh, <laughs> it's compulsory in our country, otherwise we get fined. Uh, my name is Jorge Cancio. I come from the Swiss Federal Office of Communications. And uh, on the program, you will have seen, perhaps uh, in prior versions, that this is the Ofcom um, Open Forum. Ofcom stands for uh, uh, Office of Communications, the Federal Office of Communications, not the British Ofcom. This is the Swiss Ofcom. But we are devoting the um, open forum to a specific issue, and we have uh, great experts here. The issue is uh, DNS abuse and misuse, so all the aspects uh, um, which are tied to this issue and which have been uh, discussed uh, amongst other places in uh, ICANN, in the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, very recently in Montreal, in Canada. Um, you know, uh, Internet uh, is by definition multi-stakeholder and interdependent. Interdependent might be a new uh, terminology we are using more. It comes also in the title of uh, the age of interdependence by the High Level Panel on Digital Cooperation. So this means that uh, the functioning of uh, the internet, of the DNS, depends on all the, all the players in the system. And uh, one core part of this system is, uh, let's say, uh, at least for us who are not technicians, who are not really people who have a, uh, a good education as lawyers or social scientists, it's like the digital phone book, uh, the DNS or the domain name system, which translates domain names into IP numbers. So uh, if a malicious att attacker can manipulate or uh, tamper with this phone book, we may end up in completely different places we, we expected. And uh, those places uh, might be there to, to prepare uh, an attack against us. And we will uh, see uh, the different kinds of attacks uh, which are possible. In ICANN, um, uh, we've seen uh, different statements, different discussions. I will not go into the details of it, but uh, even ICANN, the organization, had an uh, interesting uh, statement in February this year, so it's uh, already nine months away, where they observed an increase of attacks on the DNS. So we call those attacks often DNS abuse attacks. But as we will see here, there are many different uh, kinds of attacks uh, that fall into this category. There are also others which uh, go beyond the, specifically the DNS. So it's good to be as precise as possible to define the different types of attacks we are talking about because the way of remediating those attacks will vary. Uh, it uh, will be different uh, and the, the measures taken to protect the users or to protect the DNS might vary. So uh, we have uh, two long time experts from uh, different parts of the world uh, that will help us, hopefully me also, to better understand what DNS abuse can be and what can be done to preserve the DNS as a core infrastructure, as part of that public core of the internet we are supposed or where a growing international consensus is uh, emerging that we have to protect it from being tampered uh, with. Our first speaker is Christine Höppers. 
I hope I pronounced that more or less correctly, the general manager from Z.br, so from our Brazilian colleagues. And our second speaker then is Michael Hausting, lead DNS and domain abuse uh, expert at the Swiss Network Information Center, our NIC, and CERT, which is run by Switch, uh, which is our CCTLD in Switzerland, our country code top level domain. So without further introduction, I give the floor to Christine. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like, first of all, to thank the Swiss government, Ofcom and Switch, and everyone involved to create this uh, open forum. Uh, as we are talking here about DNS in a more technical way, I have some slides. I don't know if they can. Oh, OK, it's there. So we were kind of debating if we were using slides or not. But um, we would like to discuss the complexity of what we are talking about in, in more of a sense of uh, how many actors are involved and how complex it is to define abuse. So DNS is both a distributed database and a protocol. And we see abuse of the protocol and of the database. So I think it's very fair to say that we have attacks, abuse, and sometimes just misuse of DNS. Uh, so in this uh, area, usually when people talk about DNS abuse, they are talking about DNS operators and how DNS operators could solve all the problems. And I think we have more actors involved in that. Uh, we have hosting providers because some of the attacks uh, involve having hosting DNS, malicious DNS resolvers. Uh, we have ISPs that could contribute to cyber hygiene. And we would like to discuss a little bit about this. Uh, there is very little consensus on what is DNS abuse, DNS attacks, and DNS misuse. And I think one of the only examples of we have of taxonomy, it's a paper published last year that actually has a pretty complex graph that not necessarily reflects the consensus of the community, but really shows how diverse it is. It, it talks about DNS protocol attacks that usually are talking about spoofing, man in the middle, and other stuff. We have DNS server attacks that usually means taking a DNS server offline, uh, the, uh, hijacking the server itself or part of the, the traffic. Cache poisoning is a long, uh, a known attack. So, and we have in, in this category of abuse misuse, that we can debate what abuse is, what misuse is, if it's attack or not. We have kind of not necessarily good uses of DNS. And we have seen first, I can issue some uh, reports on DNS reflection and amplification. And in a sense, for a long time, the community thought that open resolvers are not necessarily a problem. And then we agreed that they were. And I think this all shows how we are evolving into mapping how DNS, that's such a critical infrastructure, can be abused or used by malicious actors. And we are not going to necessarily discuss this in DTAO, but I would like to say that, for example, in the far right, they classify benign services as a malicious DNS resolver. So this is kind of confusing. And it's confusing when, for example, you have a hosting company hosting a uh, malicious DNS resolver. And you report to them, and they say, oh, just having a DNS server is not a, an abuse. Anyone can have a DNS server. And then we say, yeah, but if that server is providing wrong answers to like social networks, uh, domains, or something else, and it's being abused in conjunction with something like compromising a host or compromising a router, 
then it's not okay to have a DNS service running in there. So I think that there is a lot that other actors could do to help us have a more stable ecosystem, to help uh, users trust more DNS sensors and, and other parts of the infrastructure. And just as an example on how confusing this is, uh, this year we had two very different attacks being called DNS hijacking attacks. And that caused confusion even to the technical experts. Imagine to like people trying to decide policies or users trying to understand the threat. We had, uh, and I will give some more details in each. So the first one was um, the DNS infrastructure hijacking campaign. And this kind of campaign was very tied with the sea turtle that was uh, cited this week in several panels. But in this case, what was high compromised? Credentials at the registry, registrar. You could say that someone was trying to hijack the domain delegation. So what was being hijacked was the domain itself. It was registered, but no longer pointing to the right servers, but to servers uh, in control of the attackers. And that would be reflected to the whole internet. So the actors involved, and this is just an example, it's not like an authoritative answer, is the registrar, registrar, reseller. It's just a complex ecosystem. So that they need to be quick and reinstate the domain to the legitimate owner. So that implies that the registers need to have good policies, that they need to have good ways to identify the right owner, not only by passwords or something uh, weak. And we need the domain owners to be able to detect that someone is actually tampering with their registration. So I think it's uh, one way to see. And the other attack that was being called hijacking involved a malicious resolver hosted usually at VPS and cloud platforms, plus cons uh, consumer route compromises. So this affected Brazil very much, and we are seeing this happening since 2014. So what's compromised is the user home router. It's not something that the DNS operators, the registrars and registries could do something about. And what's being hijacked is not a domain. It's the resolution path. So people cannot trust the resolution path anymore because they are still seeing the name of, in this case, Gmail, PayPal, Netflix in the browser. Uh, depending on how they are, if they don't know how to check certificates or if they didn't pay attention that it was not secure, they would get duped. Uh, and really, who needs to act is first and foremost the hosting provider that's hosting the malicious resolver, because sometimes we have thousands of people affected at once, so that is the quickest way. That, and ISPs in general need to work more in cyber hygiene, in helping the user to disinfect. In some countries, ISPs manage the routers. In other countries, it's the user that buys them. So there are different roles. But sometimes the ISPs could alert that. So this is a kind of hijacking that like the registrars cannot act. You actually have to, to have cooperation from a whole ecosystem. But you have criminals using DNS. The, the fact that DNS is part of the critical infrastructure of the internet and that all starts with your name. So I think this is really uh, one of the, the main points that I wanted to make that what we are talking about when we talk about DNS abuse and DNS attacks is more than just domain takedowns or trying to see if there is a malicious content hosted somewhere. Because there are multiple ways to abuse uh, and misuse DNS, or how do you want to call that? But they not necessarily involve malicious domains. They involve actually subverting or compromising parts of the infrastructure, sometimes the user, the router, or, or some other parts. So, and it's really hard for the user to detect this. 
We can say, oh, the user could try, but we know that's hard. Technology is complex. It's not easy to teach how to check digital certificates, see if the authority is the right one. So it is not an easy, easy part. So, and it's also hard to detect if a domain is malicious or not. And we had plenty of discussions about that this week. So I'm not going to talk about that again. And I, who can do something about it? Of course, we always recommend that the operators, the registrars, they need to have multiple factor authentication. You should choose uh, your registry register based on good practices. And, and these registers could encourage good practices, could, in, could make it easier to use the NSSEC, to use some best practices, to use multi-factor authentication. Uh, search instant response teams, they can help in the analysis because sometimes not all actors have all the pieces of the attack. So we could help uh, see how different parts of the internet are being used to abuse and how DNS is part of a bigger abuse campaign or attack campaign. And I think most hosting providers, this is a challenge very close to our heart in Brazil. Most hosting providers, they are not re uh, really with good policies with, to deal with DNS abuse when they are being used to host malicious DNS servers because uh, the policies actually don't, don't cover that. Sometimes they just cover that you should not have open resolvers. So we are able to take these servers down when they are also an open resolver, but most of the times, uh, we get into a debate, oh, but how do I know that that bank or that organization is not actually hosting here? So you get into like a lengthy debate with something that could be resolved with a DNS query that will show who is the authoritative server for the domain, for example. So it's really a lot of policies and processes that need to be improved. And I think everyone is involved and in, needs to have like best practice, cyber hygiene. Then this week we talked a lot about the need to, to, to implement uh, standards and practices. And I think this will help a lot to reduce DNS abuse as a whole. So this was my opening contribution here. I hope that it sets the scene for a lot of discussions during the session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christine, and also thank you very much for uh, staying uh, within the time frame. Um, we will have at the end of the session 15 minutes of uh, open discussion, but if there is any immediate clarification, question, or uh, any issue of understanding of, on Christine's intervention, I don't see any appetite for that. Perhaps we are hungry and thinking about it. And Michele, you can fail me. Thank you. Thanks, Jorge. Michele Nalen, um, CEO and founder of Black Knight. We're the largest hosting provider in Ireland. And I'm also on the board of the Internet Infrastructure Coalition, which is probably the largest trade organization for uh, the infrastructure industry with members in the Americas, Europe, and further afield. Um, I mean, while I appreciate the kind of framing of the, of the issues involving DNS abuse, I do take a little bit, I do take some of the commentary about the hosting providers as potentially being a bit problematic. You might be having issues in Brazil with your, with your hosting providers, but I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, hosting providers who are like members of our of our organization and others, we do take DNS abuse quite seriously. I mean, the, the biggest issue we run into is the quality of the reports, that the reports that we are sent are unclear or full of lots of information that isn't particularly helpful, whereas if, you know, simpler, clearer, this is the issue, this is why we think it's an issue, etc., those kind of things can help. But I just think that kind of framing it that all hosting providers are not taking action or are refusing to, I think, is a little bit unfair. No, it's just that uh, actually we are very happy when it's hosted in Brazil because 
then it's quick to take down. And I'm talking about the really major ones. They always say that the reports are bad, and then when they find the reports in the back, say, oh no, you were reporting the right thing. We were not aware that this was a abuse yet, or we didn't understood what was going on. We received other countries saying, oh, this is not illegal in our country, so we are not going to take down. And really what we say is, just make a dick query for the authoritative. Who is the name server of like Santander.com.br? You can find that from the root, and they would say that's too complex. So this is what I say that it's more process and policies. And when we happen to meet people in person and they see, then they change processes, and that actually works. But the thing is that they just migrate to the next one and to the next one. And then we are, for the past five years, just going hand in hand on different companies. Uh, we are trying to work with MOG. Uh, they have a hosting uh, working group. We presented uh, this information there. Uh, we have talked to some of the uh, anti-abuse uh, service providers. They are trying to create new playbooks. But they all kind of said, oh, we were not aware that this was an issue. So this is, they kind of were aware after the media picked it up this year. But it's still uh, uh, an issue. And I think it's an issue of taxonomy. This is why I wanted to intervene. Because most of the time, we see that they are just not getting what people are reporting. And because it was a problem that's affecting one part of the world and then not another one. And I think this is where we could improve taxonomy and we could improve maybe having like policy templates of making sure which parts of, of DNS abuse are problems. And we see a lot of bashing in like registers and registries. And I think everyone needs to recognize a little bit a part of what they are doing. So I think this is really my point. And I chose like this problem more because it was like in the media and, and uh, involved several actors. So I think this is really the issue. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, for the clarification comment to the clarification comment from Michele. But I, we have uh, a colleague. Uh, a bit to the right. Uh, please go ahead. Please introduce yourself. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Doreen Mukwena. I'm from South Africa. I work for the um, ZA Domain Name Authority, um, a state owned entity which is responsible for the administering and the licensing of the .za namespace in South Africa. And um, so far in South Africa, we are the biggest uh, domain name authority with um, CCTLDs over 1.5 million rands. So, but we have a, an issue, a serious problem, colleagues. One of the serious issues that we have in South Africa is domain name abuse. Um, we have people registering these names in uh, first, second, uh, on the first and second level registration uh, for the intent of abuse and offensive registration. We have tried to get everyone, especially the financial sector, to implement DNSSEC, and it is not really being welcomed because they feel like it's a technology which comes from Western countries to Africa. And again, another issue that is very difficult for us to implement DNSSEC is the first that it's the fact that we lack the skill set. You know, um, I don't want to say this technology was brought to us and dumped there because there hasn't been any training or any skill sharing on DNSSEC. Now the question is, how do we then strengthen our policies from the register agreement to the reseller and to the registries? because now you will take down a domain name today which is spreading child pornography. After three seconds, another one is up. Is it a problem of the domain name authority or it's a problem of the registrar itself? Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah. I think this builds a, a good segue to, to the next intervention from Michael Hausting because he's also coming from a CCTLD, uh, from the Swiss one, and uh, .ch. And uh, there we are dealing also with uh, these issues and the questions, uh, DNSSEC implementation, 
how much, how quick, and uh, what are the right incentives to go about it. So uh, if it's okay for you, I'll pass the floor to Michael, and I hope that he's also able to put some light, at least from his point of view, to the question you put forward. So Michael, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Jorge. I will address that during my talk. Uh, so, I'm Michael, I work for Switch. Switch is the registry for .ch, uh, so we operate the top-level domain for Switzerland. But Switch is also the home of the NREN, and as the NREN, we run a computer emergency response team for more than 20 years, and that's why we also have a background in internet security and in cybercrime. Uh, Switzerland is, is somehow special because Switzerland has a law on internet domain names for nearly 10 years now. The BACOM wrote the law and uh, as a registry we have to implement it and uh, the so-called ordinance on internet domain names regulates what the role and the task of the registries are and I'm happy that the registry has no mandate to fight DNS abuse, but we have a mandate to fight cybercrime. And I think that's important uh, because uh, the term DNS abuse is, I think, misleading because it suggests that there is a, u a sim single problem and there's a un unified answer to that problem. And I think that's not the case. Uh, as a registry and assert, we, we have two, uh, two problems we address. Uh, one is uh, the problem of malicious registration. So people register domain names, they register them for fraud, for phishing to run fake web shops or rook pharmacies or for terrorist propaganda. Uh, sometimes we have, uh, not in Switzerland, but that's a general problem, we have uh, malware that uses domain generation algorithms and, and these domains are then registered as a common and controlled service for uh, for botnets. Uh, we have this in Switzerland too, and I will explain later how we deal with that, uh, but the main approach here is this, this is abuse, and, and we try to f identify the ab abusive registrations and handle them together with the authorities. Uh, completely different from that problem, we see the problem that there are attacks on the DNS system, and that's something where, where DNSSEC fits in because it's, it's a small step to make the DNS more secure. So uh, DNS attacks, Christine already talked about them. Uh, so the, the, the main common issue here is not really attacks on the DNS, but uh, websites that are compromised. So you set up a phishing page at a compromised website and then you send out a few million phishing emails and, and then the DNS is involved. Uh, we also saw the uh, what I call domain delegation hijacking attacks in Switzerland. Uh, Christine already mentioned the sea turtle campaign. Uh, Switzerland was affected and what happened there after the registrar was compromised that uh, a third authoritative name server was, uh, was put into the zone file and uh, this third authoritative name server gave wrong answers, enabling the attackers to get a certificate and also to, to steal the email credentials from, from the mobile phones. So with, without doing anything, the users just went into a wireless network, they got the wrong answer for the EMAP server and because the mail server had a valid certificate, the, their credentials were sent to the attackers. Uh, we then have a DNS hijacking attack, so that's, for me that's everything that's in the resolving path. So if you get a wrong answer, th 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 there are different ways to do these attacks, it's, it's more than one. Another thing we see are subdomain hijacking attacks, so these are basically subdomains that point to a domain name that is either not registered or can be overtaken somehow by attackers, and so you can uh, set up a web page with a third level domain name of your target and it's, it's completely legitimate, you even, it looks legitimate, you even get a, a TLS certificate for that. Uh, we see, yeah, Rook DHCP servers and that, that lead you to 
to a DNS server that gives you selectively wrong answers. So uh, if you are in, in wireless networks, maybe you get the wrong DNS server that gives you 99% right answers, but just also in that case, uh, Z-Turtle gave you the wrong answer for your uh, email server. And then if your email client connects to the wrong uh, email server, you lose your email credentials. Uh, and we also see a lot of um, hijacking for, for Black Hat SEO now, so that is uh, domains are hijacked and uh, or, or compromised and just used for search engine optimization. Uh, for all these cases on the left side, we, we act as a cert, so that means we're doing incident response. Uh, but the goal here is to to um, to inform and support the affected party. So usually you either have a domain owner or a website owner that uh, is compromised and we send out emails and inform them and tell them what to do. We try to mitigate these issues. Uh, for example, we share information on these domain names uh, in Switzerland and also with a larger security community. Uh, to mitigate the problem, for example, if, if a domain is hijacked, it will be most likely blocked by the ISPs in the DNS firewall for, for the first 24 hours, so that uh, the risk that people lose their credentials there is low. And we also do remediation, that means we, we send uh, takedown notices to the hosters and tell them, hey, you have a compromised website, please clean up. And that works pretty well. Uh, we do that for for about 10 years now and, and uh, all the large hosters in Europe and usually after two or three hours they clean up. There are a few smaller ones that don't have the resources but uh, f for the compromised part usually cleanup is done within 24 hours. Uh, what we also do is regarding DNSSEC we give free trainings uh, in DNSSEC to uh, authoritative name server operators and also to, to smaller ISPs. Uh, we teamed up there with, with uh, PowerDNS last year, for example, and, and they gave a one-day training that just gives you the essential knowledge of DNSSEC and how to implement it and also to demystify a little bit the, the, the whole topic because 10 years ago DNSSEC was not ready to implement but now it's quite easy. So in the, in the most uh, resolvers it's just one line of, of config and, and your DNS server is resolving. Uh, we also try to promote uh, open standards like DNSSEC, like uh, DMARC which is quite important to, to fight uh, email spoofing uh, and we are working together with the government uh, to strengthen the resilience to cyber attacks. Because I think uh, DNS is, is ubiquitous and every cyber attack has somehow a DNS component. Uh, that basically was the attack, attack part, but we also face uh, malicious registrations like most of the CCTLDs and also GTLDs do. Uh, I'm sure you all know about the problem of fake web shop. That, that is what keeps us busy or what kept us busy the last three years. Uh, we see domain names registered for web shops uh, and if you order something like this on a web shop, if you're lucky, you get something like this. And if you are not lucky, uh, you get nothing, but in both cases your credit card is stolen. Uh, now, as a registry, Identifying and analyzing and making a decision on, on these kind of abuse is, is out of our scope. We, we don't know which shop is, um, is legit and which one is, is a fake one. That's why we work together with the police in that case. Uh, the ordinance on internet domain names gives us uh, some authority to ask uh, Swiss authorities for support. And we, for example, we're allowed to share information with Swiss authorities about registrants even without their agreement. That means we, we see uh, suspicious registrations. We are allowed to report them to the police and they can make a decision and give us an order on what we have to do with that. 
so basically, on the right side, you see a statistic about the fake web shops we took down in the last five years. Uh, the red bars are web shops where we try to identify the owner, and usually the owners of fake web shops don't identify themselves. So we are allowed by the ordinance on the internet domain names to take them down after 30 days. However, with a fake web shop for 30 days, you pay $5 for the domain name, you sell five pairs of shoes for $100, $100 you make a lot of money. Uh, that's why it continued after that, and uh, by the end of last year, we started together with the police to take them down immediately. That's also something that the ordinance of internet domains allows us. If there's a reasonable suspicion that a domain is used to, uh, to steal credentials and personal data. And we as a registry are not able to identify that abuse, but the police, they are investigating these cases and they, they are following the campaigns of the fake web shop owners. They know exactly when a fake web shop is used to steal uh, addresses or credit card data. And that's uh, how we were able to take them down uh, immediately and keep them offline until the owner uh, identified himself. And until now, we took down 20,000 of these domain names. None of the domain owners uh, identified himself. Uh, so how is the whole process working? Uh, this is Switch, this is the registry, so we have the database of all registered domain names, and we have a pattern of, re of registrar data, so basically who is the registrar, who is the name server, what emails is used, and we use that to identify uh, once every day m malicious new registration. So we do that every morning at six o'clock, and uh, send the data to the police. The police then uh, automatically makes screenshots of these websites. They see, is it responding at all? Uh, and after they made the screenshot, uh, there's an analyst from, from the police in Switzerland, and he then makes the decision is that something that is malicious where we need a takedown, or is it something we can ignore? So after the, the analysis of the website, there are three possibilities. Uh, one possibility is to do nothing. Uh, the second thing is, okay, it's, it's a registration that is, is suspicious. For example, if we have search engine optimization to fake web shops, we cannot take them down immediately because there is no no immediate danger that credentials are stolen. So the police ask us to identify the owner and usually we take them down after uh, 30 days. But if it is a fake web shop and the police is sure that the owner of the web shop will steal the personal data of, of buyers in these web shops and will steal the credit card, they send us a request to immediately take the domain down. Uh, usually we send that there's a job that sends the data to the police at 6 o'clock and at 7 or 7.30 we, we have the list and, and the order from the police to take them down. Uh, everything is uh, transparent, so we make a report, the police makes a report, they both go to the Office of Communication uh, and also in the uh, emails we send to the domain holder we always tell inform the domain owner about his rights. So in theory, the domain owner can say, okay, I don't want my domain to be taken down. I want a formal request by an authority. But uh, so far, for 20,000 takedowns, we haven't received one, one answer yet. Uh, so that's what we do against malicious registrations. And malicious registrations are not only fake web shops, but if I look at the number, the fake web shops are currently the ones that that, that keeps us busy. We also have uh, domains that are registered for phishing, for malware distribution, for terrorist propaganda, and there we work with other authorities. Uh, the authorities in Switzerland have to be accredited by the Office of Communication, and so currently we have uh, four authorities that are accredited. One is the government, so Melanie, so basically that's, uh, they're responsible for phishing and for malware. We have two cantonal polices, uh, they are 
responsible for protecting citizens. So basically, we do all the uh, fake webshop protection with the Cantonal Police of Zurich, and we have the Federal Police that is responsible for more international uh, crime and also terrorism. Uh, what are the key success factors for to, to keep .ch a clean domain? I think uh, the regulation helps us because it uh, enables us to do things. It enables us to share information. It enables us to suspend the domain name uh, and encourages. And it also requires cooperation. For example, uh, as a registry, if we see a phishing page, we can suspend the domain name for five days. After that five days, we have to turn it back online because the, we, we just have the power for, for these five days. And if we want to suspend it for longer time, we need one of the accredited authorities to, to send us an informal request for up to 30 days until we then can uh, delete the domain name because the domain name, the, the fishers usually don't respond to our requests. Uh, and that cooperation is, is critical. I think uh, for phishing, we work with Melanie for, for fake webshops with the police. And only together we can, we can solve this problem. I don't think there's a single entity that, that uh, can keep up with this problem. So as, as a registry, I mean, we can act fast, but we don't have the, the ability to analyze websites and to judge on content. There's also other things like we have the pharmacies, we have fake financial offers, and as a registry, there's no way that we can make a decision on that, and that's why we need to rely on the financial regulator, on the medical regulator to make the decision there. Uh, because they, they have experts that can judge it, and uh, that's important. And the last thing that's, at least for the fake web shops, that's critical is because you have 20,000, so automatization is critical because you can't handle that manually. Uh, but it's also easy because the bad guys, they also use automatization, and that's what enables us to do the detection. Uh, yeah, as a last one, I think that cooperation really is the key and that uh, no single entity can solve the problem at that sometimes I see finger pointing and say, oh, the hoster needs to fix it, or the registry needs to fix it, or the police needs to fix it. And I think uh, if we try to go that way, we will not be able to solve the problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. This brings us back to the idea of multi-stakeholder. So, and interdependence, we have to work together. And uh, also in a, in a small country like Switzerland, where everyone is counting really the pennies and uh, the citizens have ultimate control on uh, what bodies are established. This is uh, a question of necessity that uh, everyone works with everyone and that we establish as efficient procedures as possible instead of big new authorities which uh, no taxpayer would, uh, would accept. So, I think that uh, we also heard, we heard uh, a couple of times uh, the name Melanie. Uh, Melanie, just uh, for your information, is uh, the National Cybersecurity Center. It has uh, an official name which is much more complicated, but it's the National Cybersecurity Center in Switzerland. And uh, for moderating the discussion, the Q&A, I will pass uh, the floor to my colleague Adrian Koste from uh, Melanie. But before, uh, and I'm uh, really thrilled that so many of you have been taking pictures of the presentation, uh, both on the table and in the sidelines. So people are paying really attention, and that's great to see. Um, I would really ask uh, both Michael and Christine that if it's possible that we upload the presentations to the website of the IGF when, uh, where the session is presented so that everyone 
can uh, download uh, the, the presentations. And of course, I guess that both Christine and Michael and also Adrian and myself, to the extent uh, which that it's useful, we are also uh, very open to take this offline and to continue dialogue and cooperation uh, uh, after this session. But uh, now, I, as said, I will pass the floor to Adrian to moderate the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge, and thank you to the two presenters. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, so I'll open up the floor right away if someone has an intervention or comment, questions. I have a question. So during the presentation, you said many times that you would take the sites down. Um, I'm assuming that a registry can only stop the domain name from being resolved to an IP address. So does that mean you're working together with the hosting providers to, to actually take the site down, or what exactly are you doing? Thanks. OK, I think the question is for me. Uh, so if we talk about a takedown, then as a registry, we remove the delegation of the domain name. So if we receive an order by the police to suspend the domain name for 30 days, uh, we remove the delegation in the .ch zone file so the domain no longer resolves. Uh, the registrant itself, he still is the owner of the domain names, so uh, he has 30 days time to identify himself, and if he does, we will uh, lift the suspension of the domain name. But as I said, nobody replies, and, and that's why the domain stays offline until it's deleted after 30 days. Uh, that, that's a domain name takedown. That's the removal of the delegation. There's also a takedown of content. And that's if we have compromised websites, we send a takedown request to the web hoster and say, uh, we, we identified a phishing page on that domain name on the website you are hosting. Please take it down. And usually the, the web hosters, uh, if it's phishing, if, if there's a phishing form on the website, they will do that. Uh, within 24 hours in average. Yes, please. Um, thank you for the presentation. And I must say, I guess I just uh, gave myself a friend, because after this presentation, I will hunt you down. And one more thing I wanted to ask. You actually said that um, you take down um, domain names, which are spreading propaganda and what's not. In South Africa, we have an issue of um, electro engineering, especially when it comes to elections. Um, we have a whole lot of domain names which are registered for the purposes of spreading propaganda and uh, false information, especially informa uh, disinformation and fake news. Now, how do we then bridge the gap between taking down a domain name which is uh, for malicious purposes without being seen as if you are being censored, you know, if, as if like you're censoring people? Because on the multi-stakeholder model, we shouldn't uh, practice censorship at all. But how do we then bridge the gap between misuse and censorship? Thank you. Yeah, I'll take this one. <laughs> um, well, we. Uh, we don't tackle the freedom of speech uh, issue with this because uh, uh, what we are trying to do is taking down uh, websites or clean up the Swiss domain space. We don't even necessarily want to take down the content of the internet. We just uh, see that there's, uh, there's a trust level in, in our top level domain and when users go to a .ch domain or a web shop on a .ch domain that they are not a uh, victim of fraud or that, that they are not f uh, victims of phishing. So this is a, uh, mainly a, a measure to, to clean up our CCTLD uh, from, from fraud and from criminal, um, from criminal behavior. So this is not uh, uh, meant to, to limit any fake news or any, any spreading of some propaganda. Uh, uh, when it comes to the terrorist propaganda, there is a specific law in Switzerland that says you cannot uh, um, uh, uh, make propaganda for ISIS or for Al-Qaeda or stuff. And there, there's also the, um, the federal police that will investigate and they will decide on 
this is propaganda for this entity that is forbidden in Switzerland. But uh, fake news is, is not forbidden in Switzerland. So uh, you can spread whatever uh, <laughs> you, you want to. Um, yeah, Dirk Krishnovsky, uh, registry operator for dot .Berlin and dot .Hamburg city top-level domain names and vice chair of the GEO top-level domain group. Um, my question targets a problem we, we have also in Germany where not only dot .de domain names are, are used for uh, fake shops but also dot .com domain names which are in a similar price range at the registrar. How do you deal with, with uh, I, I guess you have dot .com fake shops targeting Swiss users as well. How, how do you deal with them? Well, that, uh, that concerns the .com domain space. Uh, and uh, we are mainly trying to uh, build trust for our own CCTLD. I believe every registry needs to be mindful of their reputation. I mean, .com is the biggest, and it's really hard for them to uh, to measure the to take, yeah, uh, um, measures across the board. But uh, when you operate, when your registry, uh, or as in case of Switzerland, we have our CCTLD, we try to improve the the trust there. And uh, I mean, what we do is a very pragmatic approach. So there needs to be quick action because in the internet everything is real time. But there is also the uh, due process. So uh, if you are uh, for every registrant, we need to have the, the possibility open to enter into due process so he can request a formal decision by an authority why this shop is taken down. And what we do after these 30 days when they don't identify themselves, then they decided to not enter due process. They don't want a decision. They are OK with us deleting or uh, well, first suspending, but then also revoking the domain name. But this is an administrative measure. This is not a criminal proceeding in, uh, in the first place. But uh, there's certainly, there, there should be uh, an international law enforcement efforts to tackle the, the, the web shop, the, the fake web shop uh, issue. But that is a police or it's a law enforcement matter. Uh, but. From, from, the, uh, from the DNS operator point of view, or from the registry and registrar point of view, you just want to have as, as few fraudulent or abusive registrations as possible, and there are measures that you can take to verify the, the a registrant, and criminals, they don't want to be verified. So uh, if you put a process in place that allows uh, a... a um, uh, um, a suspension of a, of a domain name, you use it and yeah, if you do a good work, you will, uh, as Switch does a very good work, for how many, 24,000 domain names you have suspended, you said. No one ever complained. So uh, this is also a quality management uh, uh, thing. Any other interventions? Michele? Well, there's somebody behind you as well. Maybe let Alan go first since he hasn't spoken. Uh, th thank you. Thank you, Alan McGilvery from uh, Syria, from Canada. I'd just like to ask, ask Michele, uh, not Michele, Mikhail, um, how do you identify the potentially suspicious registrations? And secondly, if, you can't, if you're so successful in identifying these, why do you not val deal with the issues at the front end? In other words, preventing them from registering. Good question. Uh, so we, we have patterns that allow us to identify the, uh, the suspicious registrations. And because the adversaries use automatization, it's quite easy because they always use the same email provider, they always use the same uh, DNS servers. Uh, and we also share that information with other CCTLGs that do similar things. But what we see is if we really uh, found a pattern and then uh, really took down the domains, there's a change in the behavior and a change in the pattern. Uh, and the second question was that 
if we are able to identify them, why don't we take immediate action at the time of registration? And that's a simple answer, because the law doesn't allow us. So far, the law requires that we have to uh, register a domain to every registrant. Uh, but there's a revision of the law, and I hope that with that revision we get the possibility to uh, identify uh, potential suspicious registrations at the time of registration and then uh, take some action at the time of registration. Uh, but the re revision is currently ongoing and most likely it will be in effect in a year, but then we plan to see if we can move the, the identification of suspicious registrations right to the, to the registering process and take an action there. Thanks. So, Michele? Uh, yeah, thanks, Michele Neil again. Um, I think, you know, the, the Swiss method sounds like, you know, you've solved some things, but you seem to be focusing entirely on just the .ch namespace, which is, you know, why we're all, some of us are obviously are kind of going, you know, what about all the .coms and what about the other TLDs? Um, so, are you, the, I suppose the question really then is, are you collaborating with uh, the other country code operators, I mean, like, you know, URID have their new um, system that they're about to turn on in the next couple of weeks, which will be kind of doing a predictive analysis of potential uh, abuse up front. Now, that doesn't deny the ability of the domain to be registered, but it does slow down the registration, which is, might be something that could be of use to you. Uh, and then just in terms of the GTLD space, just for those who aren't aware, um, most of the larger providers, so GoDaddy, Affilius, Amazon, and several others, we all signed on to this um, DNS abuse framework in, in the run-up to the ICAM meeting in Montreal, which you know, just lays a basic line of you know, things that we will take action on without having to get court orders. But just on the co collaboration, I suppose that would be interesting to hear about. Okay, the, the question was uh, on collaboration. Uh, we share that information with the other uh, CCTLDs within the center, within the Council of European Top-Level Domains, uh, and we are open to share it also with the GTLD space, because I think, uh, I mean, the patterns, they're changing, they're not changing fast, but sometimes we miss, miss something. So we st our old patterns still match, but there's a new pattern we don't get. And then at some point, someone else reports something to the police, and we see there's a domain name and our pattern didn't match, and then we update our patterns. But I think there we can get better if we cooperate more, because I think the patterns, that's something we also found out when cooperating with other CCTLDs, they're always the same. So that they don't have a certain pattern for a certain registration schema for one CCTLD, they just use it over all CCTLDs. And so if one CCTLD detects a new pattern, uh, yeah, we share it, and, and the other CCTLDs can, can also make use of it. Uh, and if there's interest in sharing these patterns over with, with other entities, we are open for that. And then, we, of course, we share our law or our policy with everyone who is interested. So that they, but uh, if, if you are operator registry, you can put policies in place, but then you need to enforce them. So that's uh, another thing. So with this, uh, is there any last uh, burning question or comment that someone wants to make? Because otherwise we'll wrap up. So thanks everyone for coming. So numerous. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have giving you back one minute. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the IGF and hope to see you soon and that you enjoy also the PowerPoint presentations as soon as they are online. Thank you.